coming from where you've come from of the struggles and the lack. You're like, I can't make those mistakes again, even though they might not have been mistakes. Hi, I'm Gracie Mercedes, and welcome back to Not Blank Enough, a podcast about everyday insecurities and triumphs. Today, I'm chatting with actor, DJ, and fashion lover, Tony Okumboa. We spoke about his upbringing in Nigeria and London, how he landed his DJ gig on Ellen, and the dark times that led him to his current gig as a series regular on the hit TV show, Bob Hart's Abishola. All this and more in this episode we titled, Not Disciplined Enough. Well, hello, Tony, and welcome to Not Blank Enough. I'm so excited to talk to you. Thanks, Gracie, for having me. Thanks for being here. And now that we are doing season two uh, with video for YouTube, (laughs) we can see that you are in a green room, according to your (laughs) your Zoom name. And that's because you are on set, because you are currently a series regular on Bob Hart's Abishola on CBS. How's that going? Yes, yes, yes. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. But um, yeah, there's a lot more to the green room thing, though, but I'm sure you'll talk about it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So let's start from the beginning. I mean, usually I just I just have people literally go from like upbringing and like where you're from, what that was like growing up, where you grew up. and, and, And then we'll and then we'll, you know, we'll have our little chat. So my parents are Nigerian. I was born in England, um, educated in England, Nigeria, and New York. Um, So basically, I was born in England, went to school there, went back to Nigeria for a while with my parents because, you know, they did that whole immigrant thing. They went to England for a better education. Then when they got fed up of England, I guess, they moved back to Nigeria with the kids. Mm. We went to school there. And then when we got old enough to go to, like, university and stuff, we ended up moving to uh England back to England but without my parents were you and in London from England yes in London I was in London mm-hmm. and then after that I ended up going to um New York to go to drama school and I uh moved to LA and the rest is history <laughs> tell me what your upbringing in London and Nigeria were like so how, how old were you when you left London when I left London I was super young like I think primary school I don't know what the equivalent of that is in America. Probably elementary school, I'm assuming. Yeah, elementary, there you go. And then um, by the time I moved back to Nigeria, to England, I went to, we do what's called A-levels, which is like mm. just before you go to university. So like our high school? Yeah, just okay. before you step go to university. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That was the, so that was the window. Um, growing up in it, Nigeria was fun. Yeah. It was really a lot of fun. Um, I was talking to someone about this today. We were naughty, incredibly <laughs> naughty. <laughs> but then again, who isn't naughty at any any, any at that age anywhere right. in the world? We were able to have incredible amounts of fun, a lot of concerts, a lot of parties. Oh. We were really into fashion, like majorly into fashion. Oh, really? We used to read magazines like Right On. I don't know if you remember that magazine. I don't. No? <laughs> yeah, we used to read magazines like Right On and... Top of the Pops from England was a biggie for us. It was right um, on an American magazine or a British It was an American magazine. magazine. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was an American I don't know. magazine. I don't know. Yeah. I wasn't really into magazines when I was younger, though, I don't think so. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. That oh, makes God. Sense. We got all, we got, I mean, especially living in Nigeria, we got all our, you know, pop culture from America and, and England. So magazines like Right On, and we watched a lot of American shows like, you know, Good Times. Yeah. You know, and a lot of English shows as well. So, and Fame was a big one for us. Dynasty. Oh, yes. You know, yes. all that type of stuff. So that was, growing up in, that was growing up in Nigeria. Then back in England, I was in, I became sort of more independent. And fashion played a big part. Music, music was massive. Um, but unlike... In America, where music tends to be more compartmentalized, like it's either R&B, hip hop or like, you know, rock. It, right. In England, it was across the gamut. So a radio station would play all those things. Back oh, to back interesting. To back. Oh, that's yeah. fun. Yeah. Is so, it because uh, they had less stations or, or, or were all stations doing that? No, it was just an aesthetic. Yeah. You know, I mean, as time has progressed, there's been more like, I guess, specialized radio stations. But mm-hmm. in general, I would hear a Bon Jovi track next to a Curiosity Kill the Cat track next to a Marvin Gaye track mm. next to a Public Enemy track all on one radio wow. station. Yeah. 
So I'm assuming that's where your love of music came from and why you ended yes. up being a DJ? That's a funny one because I was a, <laughs> I was a lazy musician. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I was supposed to learn my skills to play bass, which was my instrument of choice. And I was just too impatient. So, <laughs> go so you're like, I'll just play records instead. Yeah, for sure. Stepping back a little bit, though. So you're young in Nigeria, and I'm assuming you're surrounded by people who are also Nigerian. They look like you. Absolutely. They're, they're you know, your people, basically. And then you go to yeah. London. Yes. And now you're in a big city, but I'm mm -hmm. assuming there's, well, there is a, a substantial community in uh, London, though, right? Of Nigerians or no? Am I making that up? Yeah, there's like Afro-Caribbean people. So people from the islands, mm -hmm. as well as people from Africa, mostly sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of West Africans. And, you know, now it's now it's more sort of a broader sort of selection of people. But back then it was mostly Afro-Caribbean and the predominant culture being the Caribbean and the Jamaican culture at the oh, time. Uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. And what was that like going to London and, and being kind of in this new city? I mean, you were born there, but you weren't really raised there until this time. And how old were you when you went back? I was probably 16. Oh, something wow. Something like that, 17, yeah. yeah. Um, it was it was cool. Initially, it was obviously s shaky ground and <laughs> any city, even today, you got to know where the goes and the no no goes are and everything like that yeah seeing skinheads and racist was like a big you know yeah, yeah. but but in skinheads, general i didn't even think yeah of that. yeah yeah because you didn't see them in nigeria you know right so yeah. you know <laughs> I and when not. i and when i was in nigeria when i was in england before i was too young to notice right so i come back to this and i had heard about them or read about them or seen them on tv shows or whatever and then <laughs> I, I joke about this but i remember seeing punks with the spiky hair and yeah. everything when i came back i mean i had seen boy george and you know people like that and i i was used to kind of you know more avant-garde dressing right. but to see punks on the street you were like oh my god right you know so yeah, that yeah was interesting. i mean that has to be such <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I also, I guess I've never spoken to someone who's from Nigeria or Africa, anywhere in Africa. What are the differences from where you grew up as far as, was it more su suburban, rural? Were you near a city in, in Nigeria? Like what part of Nigeria versus I, now plopping into London at 16, which is a major city? Oh, I was in the same type of setting because Nigeria was and continually is very progressive. So, you know, the, my neighbors would go, to England for holidays. Everybody would go to England for holidays. Right. And, you know, it was a pretty middle to upper middle class affluent neighborhood. And I went to a private school with people like that. You know, we weren't in, in shock or in awe of England. Right. Um, or any Western country, come to think of it. That was when Nigeria was, you know, still fun. A lot of things have changed. A whole nother story. Yeah. But it was, um, it wasn't a culture shock per se, but we were also brought up with the mentality that we are captains of industry, lawyers, doctors, engineers, you know, presidents. Yeah. And so w the way we carried ourselves in England was we held our heads high. I love that. I love yeah. that. And so we now you get to high school up. or the equivalent of high school, I guess, in England, yeah. in London. Yeah. And what kind of kinds are you becoming friends with? Like who you oh, all out. kinds, because it was the public school system in England was very good and multicultural. And so it was all kinds of people. But yeah. the, it wasn't so much it wasn't so much the ethnicity as opposed to the cliques that people belong to. So they're like the goths and the <laughs> punks and the fashionistas and the soul boys. So you just fit into each ever one. And it wasn't like you can't come over here and talk to us. No, everyone right. was like one of my best friends was a punk called Sam. And uh, she used to have the side of her head shaved and everything. And she was such a darling. I don't even know where she is today. I love so, that. Yeah. I love that. That's so interesting. And, and so I feel like opposites of people who grew up in the States around the same time, because I think we're around the same age, um, where things are so clicky in that same way but in a more like americanized way it's like the jocks yeah. are here and the cheerleaders are here and the cool girls are here whatever but then there's also 
such race, you know, deep racism. And then, and then, so like the black kids hang out here and the white yes. kids hang out here and the lot. So to hear that in London, where you were at least, it was a little, a little more. I think it was across the board in most major cities and, and it is reflective of the music. Mm. So for instance, if you see um, a lot of ska music is influenced by Jamaican music and mm -hmm. influenced by punk music. And like, that's why bands like Big Audio Dynamite and, you know, then you have people like The Clash and then Paul Weller, who went on to do Style Cancel. All these were just an amalgamation of cultures. So it was always very, very giving and together, so to speak. And it wasn't drawn or wrong. I mean, racism did exist. But right, of course. In, you know, there was pockets where you could just be yourself. That's cool. Getting to the theme of the show. Not yes. blank enough. Um, <laughs> in your younger days, was what was there a blank for you? And if so, what was that blank? It depends on where I was and what I was into. Mm. I think in, in my younger days, I always wanted to be... So, so okay, so not blank enough in that context. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to be an individual. Mm. And to the degree that if someone was wearing something, you didn't want to wear it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, by the look of your, you right now, I mean, you're such a fashion... <laughs> what do you call male fashionista? Is it still I, a fashionista? <laughs> I, would think, I, I think they call them dandies or something, but I don't even know. Yeah, really? that's a whole nother... No, there's a whole, there's a whole movement called the dandy movement, dandyism. Okay. And yeah, well, it's like really specific. They wear their cuffs at a certain height. And they, oh, got it. There's, there's a lot of dandies in Africa. And well, you super, always super look stylish. sharp, is my point. Thank um, you. As you Coming from are, you, are with your right knowledge now. of fashion, oh, please. I bow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, so I, I get this, what you're saying. So you wanted to be unique. You wanted to be one of the yes. kind. You didn't want to wear what other people were wearing. No, no. Right. And, and so how did you was feel? that was thing. Yeah. Did you, how did you feel? Did you feel like you were meeting that or, or did you feel like you were falling behind? I, I mean, it was a constant catch up thing, wasn't it? Mm. Because somebody else would always come out with something else. And, and it stemmed from my parents or my mother in particular, always telling us that we're special. Mm. And so we wanted that. it to, me in particular, I can't speak about my siblings, but I wanted it to be manifest in when people see me, they kind of know I'm special. And it also, obviously, a level of insecurity was in there as well because, you know, I was young. But, um, you know, it was the type of thing whereby I remember in England, we would get steel capped Dr. Martin boots, get rid of the laces, use big kilt pins to hold oh. it together oh, wow, and cut yeah. patterns in the toes just to wow. be different. It was always about originality and difference and everything. And I've never heard anyone call them Dr. Martins before. I've always what would they call them? Doc Martins. Okay, yeah, okay. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is that a Tony thing or is that a British thing? I don't know. I mean, I think it, people in England probably call them Doc Martins. Or okay, Docs, yeah. we call them Docs. Docs, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I like yeah. that you call them Dr. Martins. Um, <laughs> Okay, so maybe not feeling special enough or striving to feel special. Yes, to mm -hmm. be different. Yes. To be different, yeah, to be Absolutely. unique. And so then you said you're in London, then you went to New York for, for drama I went school? to New York, yes. Went to Lee Strasberg and then uh, NYU had a program with Lee Strasberg at the time as well as the Meisner Studio. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And how was that? What was that experience like? That was great. That was the the sort of hot bed of hip hop at the time. Like mm. I was living in Brooklyn in Fort Greene and down the road was Biggie. What year was Bed -Stuy. this? Around? This was in 90s, the 90s, the 90s yeah. early, mid 90s, something like that. Mm -hmm. And Vibe magazine was the big magazine at the time, which yep. was started by Quincy Jones. You know, mm -hmm. remember that? And mm -hmm. all my friends like worked at the magazine. They had just graduated from college and unbeknownst to me there was such a thing as hbcus at mm -hmm. the time i didn't know yeah so they come a lot of them had come from howard and spelman and 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 schools like that and so i was thrust into this sort of area in brooklyn with spike lee and i think chris rock lived there it was yeah. this really cool time yeah oh yeah. that's when new york was cool <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So I you know mean, exactly what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I was born and raised there. I didn't move okay. to LA until my late 20s. And, you know, it was for a reason. I, I, 
I kind of was like, I was born here. I was raised here. I went to NYU. I was, I was like, I went right, to college so here. It. I'm like, I'm ready to go. Um, but also, <laughs> New York just didn't, there's no grit to it anymore. Like it used to be like this, like, ah, this like gritty kind of yes. edgy place. And now it's a little too clean Disney-fied. and gentrified. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Disney-fied. I think when they did 42nd Times Square, Street and yeah. got rid of all that area, that because I used to work up there. I used to work in a restaurant called B. Smith's. I used to be a waiter. yeah. And we would walk past junkies and pimps and uh-huh. boys and, uh-huh. you know, and we'd go to work and everybody was cool. You know, nobody bothered anybody. And right. same thing in Fort Greene. It was just so dope. And we would play football in the park, like soccer. And then it just started changing. Yeah, it's crazy. When it. I was in high school, two of my best friends lived in the Lower East Side and I wasn't allowed to like, we weren't allowed to hang out in front of their houses because of all the drugs and the drug dealers. Yes. You yes. have to like go straight up to the house. If you're going to their yeah. house, you got to go right up to the apartment. And we would go to like Cat's Deli after school. Or we, oh you know, it gosh. was just a different time. And now uh, I go to Lower East Side. I'm like, oh my God, the gentrification like, is it's off ridiculous. the chain. It's yeah. Ridiculous. So New York's definitely a, a different place. I totally feel that. Did you always want to be an actor? Did you, did you know you always wanted to be an actor? No, 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 I didn't. I always, um, I thought I was going to be a professor because I was, apparently, I was a bright kid. And I, <laughs> and I had this notion that professors know everything. Mm. And I thought I was too good for my own, you know, too cool for school. Yeah. And I thought I was Mr. Know-it-all, so I thought I'd be a professor. But then I, my parents were like old school. So uh-huh. they were like, you got to study a profession. Mm-hmm. And so I was pre, no, no, I wasn't pre anything. I was studying to be a lawyer in my oh, wow. A-levels. Wow. Uh-huh. And then when I got to university, I said, you know, I'm not comfortable doing this. I want to do what I want to do. And yeah. so. How your mom take that and your dad? Ooh. <laughs> it, it was interesting. Listen, at the end of the day, they just wanted me to get a degree because right. they were like, listen, if all else fails, you can fall back on mm-hmm. teaching. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. So, you know. And then when did you decide you wanted to be an actor? Because for someone who's so into music and knows so, like you're so knowledgeable about music, I was surprised to know that you m- knew you wanted to be an actor at such a young age. Oh, God, yeah. Um, so I wanted to be an actor from when I did a school play when I was five. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I was the lion who couldn't roar but sung. Oh, that's great. That's yes. really sweet. Can you sing? No. I can oh, okay. hold a note if I have to with a lot of practice. Got it. <laughs> but, you know, I was a kid. It's like, who knows what, whether I was on key. Or, right, right, right. Uh, um, but that was when I first decided I wanted to be an actor. Okay. And then I obviously took detours due to societal pressures, parents, you know, all that type of stuff. Yeah. At what age did you then move to Los Angeles? Los Angeles? <laughs> so later. there's a st- There's a story behind that. I can't remember what age it was. Mm -hmm. It was, I can't remember. I have to think about that one. Yeah, that's But it's, I've been, I've been here for like 15 years now or something like that, maybe longer. Yeah, I think we moved out here around the same time. Yes. And I I feel like I I met you like pretty soon after I got here. Yeah. So I, I had fallen into one of those holes, which I have fallen into since, which was, I was waiting tables in New York and I got a job doing Raisin in the Sun at a theater in Virginia called Mill Mountain Theater. Mm. And I thought, okay, this is it. I'm going to be a bona fide actor now, theater actor, making a living. So I quit my job waiting tables, went off for six weeks to do this play, came back, and I couldn't get arrested. And so I fell into like You couldn't get arrested? It's an English term whereby oh. you, you you can't get you can't get a job. I'm sorry. Oh. I was like, what do you mean you couldn't get arrested? Why would you want to get arrested? I've never heard that before. You've never heard that before? Where, no. you, where you can't get a break? You just couldn't get I've arrested. I've heard you can't get a break, but I've never heard I couldn't get arrested. Yeah, well. But now I, I know. Guess, okay, so that's a British you know. term. So you couldn't yeah. get a job. I couldn't get a job. I couldn't even get my weight job back. Yeah. And Ugh. so... Years ago, I had worked in fashion. I had worked for a company called Diesel years ago. Yeah, I remember Diesel. And so back then, Diesel was still coming up and everything. So I got a job with them as a visual merchandiser because I knew everybody there. Mm. And then one day they said, listen, we need somebody in L.A. We know you're an actor and you're going to want to move there soon. Mm. Why don't you go out to L.A.? And so they did. They sent me out to L.A. 
and they paid for me and I was working with um, Diesel as their East Coast sales rep for menswear. And then after a while, um, I started going on auditions and I started booking things and it was just not tenable to do both. Right, so, right, right, yeah. right. And that was in 2000. 2000, okay. So about, yeah. that's like over 20 years ago now. Yeah, 20 Isn't years Isn't that ago. crazy that 2000 is 21 Man, years ago? That's I remember insane. it like it was yesterday. <laughs> okay, so that brings yeah. you to Los Angeles and now you're yes. acting. You're like going on auditions. Here and there, you're, yeah. doing like, you're doing the thing. You're doing the acting hustle. Yeah. It's funny because yeah. I did an interview earlier today with um, this, this group I'm a part of telling them my life story. And right. we have such parallels where we like, tried all these like we did all these things to get yes. to the thing we wanted to do kind of thing absolutely yeah like yeah. i was a producer i thought i wanted to be a reporter and then i was a producer and then i did some styling and then i moved yes. out here and then i did the acting so i totally get it i also <laughs> think people in their like 30s and 40s have have lived many lives at this point absolutely yes. so that's also wonderful how'd you get into like djing and all that stuff so what? DJing, I started doing in England because I was lazy, like I said, and right. I learned how to DJ with uh, a couple of friends of mine who had records, one one in particular called Carl. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> and so I I booked a movie called The Gateway to Heaven, and we went and shot it in Germany, and it paid me a chunk of money, it paid me mm. like maybe at the time, maybe like $20,000. Oh, that's a good job. And And my mom... My surrogate mom, who's now my real mom because my biological mother passed. But anyway, my mom had just sold a house in England and she gave all the kids, three of us, she gave us a bit of money each. Oh, wow. And I said, listen, mom, I'm just going to buy a house. Mm -hmm. And so I bought this house in Echo Park. I thought, OK, I got to pay a mortgage. I got to get a real job. Right. And so I started um, as a sales rep for Paul Smith Men's Footwear. So I was okay. traveling around the world. And I remember specifically, I was in New York and I get a call and they were like, Ellen is doing a new talk show that she's looking for a DJ. Oh, wow. And this was her her friend, a friend of mine who's, who used to be her hairdresser. Oh. And he was like, oh, she's looking for a new DJ. And I said, and so, and so they said, okay, we'll set up a phone call with you. Uh -huh. So while I'm in New York, <sighs> we set up a phone call. I get on the phone with the producers and they, I could tell they weren't feeling me. Uh-oh. <laughs> You know, it's a phone right. call. I, okay. I didn't know anything about what it was going to be or anything. Yeah. But I could tell they weren't feeling me. I'm about to fly back to L.A. And I get a call from another friend of mine who is a really big photographer called Andrew McPherson. And he says, listen, we've got this phone call to do Britney Spears. Because what I would do is this. I would DJ on photo shoots. Oh, oh cool. So they would have so a live I DJ for like big yes. photo shoots. Yeah. So Jesus basically Christ. what I would do is I would research the talent, what type mm. of music they like, their favorite song. So it wasn't oh, wow. just a regular DJ set. It was yeah. a set that was tailored to them to keep their energy up. You know what it's like on yeah, a photo yeah, shoot. Yeah, 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 energy yeah. Energy dips. You keep everybody dancing and moving. And so we get a call. I'm in New York. We get a call. They were like, we're shooting Britney Spears in New York. Stay there. Now, this was during the time of vinyl. So I was like, right. I can't stay. I've got to fly back to L.A., get oh my, my records God, and fly back. Oh, so my God. So I fly back to L.A., <laughs> pick up my records, fly back to New York. We do the shoot. We fly back to L.A. We land, and there's a call about Ellen's being shot by my friend. Oh, yes. <laughs> I see where this is going. So now... You and DJ so, for Ellen photo shoot. So her photo shoot. And I have no attachment to it because I know I didn't get the job, so right, to speak. Right. So I'm DJing and she cracks a joke and she say, we, she says, listen, I've hired a DJ already for the show, but can I get your number? I always have parties. And I was like, okay. Cut to that Wednesday or something. I'm having dinner at Koi uh -huh. with the buyer from Barney's who I'm uh -huh. selling footwear to. Okay. And I get a call. They're like, can you come in tomorrow? I'm like, for what? They're like, mm -hmm. well, we want to, we're doing test deals with DJs. So I call my manager. My manager says, go. I go. They're negotiating, negotiating. I'm sitting outside the office waiting, waiting, waiting. My manager gets on the phone. He's like, walk away, Tony. He says, they're not trying to pay you well, da, 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 all this type of stuff. I was like, oh, oh. okay. So I left. Right. Two weeks go by. I just bought the house. I was right. fixing it up. I needed to get a regular job. I call right. my managers. I'm like, can you make sure this deal is off the table? Mm 
-hmm. And he goes, I'll call them. He calls them. They're like, no, 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 it's not. They'll give you some more money. Come back in. I go back in. And that was history. Wow. What a great so, story. Yeah, <laughs> I love so. that. And so kind of random but perfect like hollywood yeah, perfect like you, absolutely. you know who you know and where and where you are right you know right place right time i wasn't sure i wanted to do it because yeah. if you think about the terrain at the time of what talk shows were right it's ricky lake right she was the top of the air but then it was like maury povich and all yeah. the fighting and yes. all that on tv and it yes. was daytime i was like how is that gonna work i don't yeah. know if i want to be that i'm a thespian yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hers was kind of the first like feel good talk show in in a yes. long. I don't think yeah. we really had that before. I mean, maybe no. Oprah, but Oprah had serious stuff too. Yes. You know, yeah. Um, so that completely makes sense. And I think as an actor, I, I feel you. There's so so many jobs that come along that you're like, do I want to do this? How is this yeah. going to affect my acting career? Kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. But for you, it was great. You got great exposure. People knew who you were. You, you know, you still get to act. Well, right? yeah, or was it a lot not of people great? didn't. <laughs> no, it, it was great. It was yeah, great. I, yeah. I was able to sort of, you know, get exposure, get to meet a ton of people. Yeah. But a lot of casting directors didn't know I was an actor. Right. Because then you are, so. you're seen as a DJ. Yes. Which is a catch-22 that I've also dealt with. And I yes. totally get that. It's like, unless you're out. It's when I was blogging full-time mm. for eight years, and that was where all my money was coming from, and it was super mm. lucrative and easy. But then no one knew I was an actor. Everyone just thought Absolutely. I was a Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I totally get that. So yeah. while you're while you're having this experience, are, is there feeling is there a feeling of not being thespian enough? Or like are you feeling like you're not doing what you want to do, really? Absolutely. Yeah. And I tried. I mean, I produced two movies that went to Sundance oh, during wow. that period of time. Yeah, I produced the movie and was in a movie called Restless City. Mm -hmm. And then I did one called Mother of George mm. with Andrew Dosumu. He's a guy I work with in LA, in New York a lot, because I still had that New York thing, that mm -hmm. New York pool. Mm -hmm. um, so I produced a couple of movies still trying to hold on to that. I did small things here or there, but I couldn't do much. And then what was uh, life like after Ellen? So what, do you, what did you... Um, <sighs> do after that and what brought you to where you are today so I, I took a fall a big big fall when I left Ellen I thought I had it all set up mm -hmm. I thought I had enough sort of I guess you would call it chips in the game you yeah. know what I mean mm -hmm. and uh, to use the phrase I used earlier I couldn't get arrested mm. <laughs> which means he could not get a job <laughs> for yes, our American I couldn't get listeners a job. <laughs> <laughs> I could not get a job um I ended up becoming a, first of all, people wouldn't hire me for regular jobs because they'd be like, aren't you the guy from Ellen? Mm -hmm. Oh, he's not going to stay. He's not going to stay. And then I ended up becoming a, a wedding DJ. And there's nothing wrong with being a wedding DJ. It's right. good money if you get paid well and... You know, but it just wasn't me. But like, yeah. you know, hey, now we're going to call the bride and the groom to the dance floor and everybody here is going right. to line up on the left and the line. And she's going to toss the guard out. Nobody's got it. OK, now everybody with me, we're going to do the macarena. <laughs> and if I hear sweet Caroline one more time, oh I'm going to go nuts. Oh, my God. Right. Because yeah. you can't just do what you want to do. You have to cater to what they want because obviously oh my God, it's their wedding. <laughs> some people at weddings can be demanding. Oh, I bet. I bet. Yeah. Ugh. yeah. yeah. Wow. And how are you feeling during all this? How long was, did that last, too? The sort of, for want of a better description, the dark period mm. was about two and a half years, mm. maybe three years. Yeah. I mean, a lot happened through there. Like, I, I had to sort of Airbnb my house and sleep on my friends' couches. Mm. I lost my dog. Um, oh, I remember you know, seeing that on Instagram. Yeah. It was so sad. It was, it was rough. Yeah. But I, it brought me to where I am today, and I'm not ashamed of it. Yeah. I, I say it as a tale to encourage people. Because I guess this is the analogy I use. It's one thing if you've never tasted filet mignon and mm -hmm. you've been eating skirt steak and you think skirt steak's the best thing. Mm -hmm. But even if you sniffed filet mignon, which I had, mm -hmm. and then I am now back to skewered beef or whatever it is. Uh, ironically, I don't eat meat, so I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> good analogy, good yeah, analogy. Yeah. But I know what you mean. It's why there's like some kind of saying that like the the best way to hurt a rich person is to make them poor because because it's like once you if you're poor you're poor and then yes. one day you become rich and it's amazing but if yeah. you just stay poor that's all you know or if you get yes. to middle class that's all you know but 
if you're rich and then you lose that, mm-hmm. oof. Or if it's you're poor sick. and then you get rich and then you get poor again, that that's oh, yeah. a lot harder. You know, that's a, that's a struggle. So I totally yeah. feel you. And you know, in our line of work, in anything in entertainment, whether you're an actor, writer, director, produ- whatever, yes. there are ebbs and flows. There are highs Absolutely. and lows, and you have to mm. stick out or not. It's funny because I think sometimes people think of actors and they're like, oh, where, what happened to that person? And then they come back and they're like, oh, they're making a comeback. And it's like, yeah. no, they wanted to work the whole time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> they see, never went anywhere. They never went anywhere. They're still here trying yeah. to get work. It's just hard to get work. Yeah. Yeah. That oh. was a tough one. I, I was I, I Wasteland became my friend. I was selling all my clothes to pay bills and all mm. that type of stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it was tough. During the dark times, what was the biggest not blank for you? Oh, my gosh. There was a ton of them. I think the most uh, went from not talented enough. That's why I'm failing. Mm -hmm. Um, It went from not good looking enough. That's why you're not getting the roles. Mm. It went from you're not smart enough. So you earned a bunch of money and now you have none. Mm -hmm. You know, every not enough was there. Yeah. You know, it was it was rough. Yeah, it was rough. But I always believed that I would come back in some capacity. Yeah. Never knew it would be a sitcom, but I thought I would come back. In <laughs> yeah. Let's let's talk about that sitcom. Bob Hart's <laughs> Abishola, which my yes. friend Matt Jones is also on. Yes. I we were talking about you the other day. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's, I love when I see when I saw that show go and then matt was on and i was like oh my god and then i saw that you're on i'm like oh my god it's so yeah. fun to see your friends be on a show i, I, I think mary beth monroe yeah mary beth monroe she, is the other one i know yeah, too she she's <laughs> done some stuff with gumption right yes exactly and gumption yeah. is who produces this podcast yeah and so yes. mary beth um was one of the leads of a show that we produced as well yes so it's yes. all in the she, family she's hilarious yeah. yeah it's all in the family um yeah. but tell me how that that came about So the beginning of the year, I had just come out of the darker place, so to speak, because I'd sold my house, but it came back to me. It's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. And I'd just done a big AT&T commercial with Michelle Gondry, Mm -hmm. and I was the lead in it. And Mm -hmm. I'd never done, I mean, it was just like the blessings were flowing. Yeah. And I decided to take off for the first time uh, five weeks. And I went to New York. I rented an apartment, stayed in New York. And then I went around Europe and Africa for another six weeks. Oh, wow. And I get back and they call me and they're like, oh, we have this audition for you. And I go in and I read and then I get a call back and they're like, okay, it's for five episodes. And I'm like, okay. And so we do the first three, me and my colleague on the show. And then they're like, okay, we're going to make you guys recurring. Oh, amazing. And we're doubling your, uh, your salary. And I was like, okay, great. I mean, oh, oh, God, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. And then I remember specifically, we were doing a scene, and I was standing upstairs, and the camera was all placed and everything, and my phone was in my back pocket. And it rang, and I put it to silent, and it rang again, and it kept ringing. Oh, and I, and boy. I was putting it off. And then yeah. I finally, they said, cut. You know, we're going to take a five-minute break to reset. Mm-hmm. And I look at my phone, and it's my agent, and I'm like, Oh, shoot. And he calls me and, and I listen to his message. He goes, call me. And this I call him. either really he, good or really bad. <laughs> exactly. And wh- bearing where I was before, uh-huh. my head was like, oh, shit. And he starts yeah. off like this. He goes, this happens sometimes on television and it's nobody's fault other than probably the actor and the work he has done. Oh, what a jerk. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> he's like wording along those lines anyway. So and he's, he's like, trying to set you up. Uh-huh. He's like, they have decided to make you a series regular. <laughs> <laughs> and then you lose your shit. Oh, my God. I'm going to cry. Cried. I'm so excited for you. That's just like I, the best I think thing I to cried. ever hear. Yeah. 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 I think I cried. We just were so elated. And I fell down on my knees in my dressing room and I was praying oh. and... It was just, just what a, beautiful a comeback. Story. Yeah, I was the man. comeback kid. And you're playing someone kind of like you, in the sense that is he Nigerian? The character he's Nigerian. You get to use your Nigerian accent. I'm Absolutely, I get yeah. to use my Nigerian accent. But he's like me in some ways, in as much as he's Nigerian and he's now in America. Mm-hmm. But he didn't come from the colonial triangle, i.e., England. Right. You know that whole thing. So he came um, straight from Nigeria. Straight from Nigeria. Yeah, yeah. and he had probably more hardships than I did 
you know, hardships are relative, but he, you know, probably more hardships than I did. And he's a character who really wants to be Western,、mm-hmm. but he's still stuck in his Nigerian ways. And、totally. he's sort of this, he wants to be cool and hip and young and everything.、Yeah. He says things like, My accent is considered sexy and all that type of stuff. <laughs> but he's clueless in terms of how to do it. Right. So if you've、What、watched any、fun. of the episodes, he falls in love. Well, he falls for Mary Beth's character, Christina. So yeah, it's a lot、What、of fun. What a fun、um, character to play. Yeah,、and、he's fun. First of all, what a great story. Like all of it, because you do need those lows to appreciate the highs. Oh my gosh, you're so right. But also to have your, this is your first series regular, correct? Yes, absolutely. To have your first series regular be a Nigerian character, like how beautiful and perfect is that? Because they could have easily hired just any black man and had him put on like a fake accent, which they do、right. all the time.、Um, yes. So it's so nice that you were able to get that part. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Chuck Lorre was really about authenticity,、mm. and Gina Yashere, who is A character on the show, and one of the co creators and one of the writers as well,、mm. she's always fighting for authenticity. I love that. And it seems to have、uh, worked. Yeah. You know, people seem to really dig it so far.、Not、yeah. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Chuck、yeah. Laurie doesn't seem to miss. So, like, <laughs> I'm just going to say, I think you're good. I think you're good. <laughs> I, I, came out, I came out the gate with a winner there. <laughs> for sure. For sure.、Yeah. I'm like, I'm, my friend Matt, too. I'm like, You lucky bastard. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Chuck, Chuck really Lurie, likes Matt too. I'm sure. I'm sure. He's、yeah. great. I mean, Matt's so funny. So it, He's it's, hilarious. It's hilarious. perfect. Hilarious. All right. So now today, what, we have Tony today on a hit show. Like, <laughs> what is your blank now? Because you know, even when you're successful and things are going great, we still have those damn blanks. And、yes. sometimes those blanks are what like, propel us to even more greatness. Absolutely. Know what I mean? So,、yeah. what, do you, what do you got for today? I'm not. Disciplined enough. What、mm. do I mean by that?、Mm-hmm. Now the sun is shining, I need to make hay. I need to capitalize on the opportunities. Oh, I'm not doing this. I should be doing this. I'm not doing this. I should. Do you know what I mean?、Yes. You want to, especially coming from where you've come from, of the struggles and the lack,、mm-hmm. you're like, I can't make those mistakes again, even though they might not have been mistakes. Right. So maybe I'm not disciplined enough. I'm not hardworking enough. I'm not pushing enough. Because、mm-hmm. you don't want to、so, get comfortable. Yes.、Yeah. So that's constantly in your ear, just going, you, Are you doing this? Are you doing that? Are you reading? Are you writing? I think、mm. I spoke to you the other day about script writing, remember? And you recommended、yeah. a book or two.、Yeah. You know, am I, am, I, am, I, am I doing enough? Am、yeah. I capitalizing on this opportunity? Uh huh. I know, like not disciplined enough. That's great because I can totally relate to that. I, I'm、oh. the same way. I feel like I'm never doing enough, even when I'm doing a million things. And you do do a million things. <laughs> you、yeah. of all people do a million I, I things. I do. I do think. I do think that is part of the immigrant experience and being first generation and all these and coming from the families we come from. I do think there is this drive that we have that people who have been here for generations might not, not necessarily have, where it is this feeling of like, we got to work. Like, we got to work. <laughs> we got to keep working. We got to keep growing. We got to keep, you know. Yes. One up in the、yeah. last thing we did. And absolutely. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, as long as you're not like, Workaholic crazy about it. I mean, I'm very blessed to have that kind of mentality. Plus, I also have some financial commitments with my family back、mm-hmm. in Nigeria.、Mm-hmm. So, you know, I've got to work. Yeah. You know, and I've got to capitalize on the things, the opportunities I've been given. Yeah. So that I can create wealth that will be there for a while and not have to fall again. Well, I think that's a great way to end, man.、Uh, this was so fun. I got to know so much more about you. I feel like I've known you. <laughs> You know, the friends that you see every once in a while, you're like, hey, how are you? We catch up yes, for like a few seconds. Yes. But, yes. And, I, and that's been going on for years. I mean, I think, Absolutely. I, think I met you Absolutely. like 12 or 13 years ago. But to get your real like deal story, I was excited about this and, and it was really fun to get to know your story better. Well, and, thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for thinking of me and of inviting me to do this. Well, congratulations again on the show. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you and、um, thanks for having me. Everyone watch Bob Hart's Abishola on CBS. Monday nights. Check your local listing for the time. 8 30. Okay, there we go. <laughs>、yeah, 8 30 PST, but you're right. Check your local listing. Check your local listing. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Gracie. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to Not Blank Enough with me, Gracie Mercedes. You can find out more about today's guest in the show notes. Please subscribe to Not Blank Enough wherever you get your podcast and follow us on Instagram at Not Blank Enough Pod. Also, if you like what you hear, please consider a rate and review. 
Our show today was executive produced by Gracie Mercedes and Dave Hill and produced by Douglas Sarine and Colleen Beasley. Not Blank Enough is a Gumption Pictures production. 